Good morning, everyone. Um, those a uh, couple of you know me, a couple of you are new. Uh, my name's Richard Dale. I've been at TKI uh, since 2001, on and off. Um, and the subjects I teach tend to be quite technical uh, and mathematical. So um, Gen Nav is obviously the most mathematical one. It's really a maths exam, not a Nav exam at all. Uh, but um, several of the other exams uh, need uh, a little bit of maths. So um, this is to give you a basic, uh, the basics of uh, the maths you need. And I'm going to try and cover um, something about algebra and rearranging formulas. Um, I'll mention standard index form, which is our form of times 10 to the power x, if you've seen it and might be confused by it a little. Um, and it's commonly used for the physics side of it as well, so that's an important basis. Um, we'll have a brief look at trigonometry, uh, both of triangles and then extending it to circles, which is important for waveforms. Um, then vectors, there's a couple of things we need to look at uh, on vectors which come up, uh, and it's a good basis for the physics as well. Um, then we'll mention, very briefly mention ratios and how they're important, how they relate to fractions and how they are, um, how they can be manipulated and how and what they mean. Uh, and then we'll look a little bit on graphs, mainly on graphs. I'm going to um, going to be mentioning how to deal with tangents, um, and that in fact leads into ratios. That's why I'm going to do ratios, in fact, um, because in particularly in performance and principles of flight, uh, there are some issues. There are some um, important facts that are more obvious and, and more understandable if you if you are aware of how um, how gradients of tangents work. Okay, so most of this I'm going to be doing on a blackboard screen like this, um, and so we're going to start out with rearranging formulas. which is, as I say, this is out, uh, basic algebra, really. <coughs> and most of the, of the formulas that you will encounter in the exams are of the form A equals B divided by C, or A equals B multiplied by C. And in fact, these two forms are substantially equivalent uh, because if A equals B divided by C, you, would, you could rearrange that, we'll see in a minute how, to B equals A multiplied by C. So classic examples would be speed time distance calculation in, uh, in navigation and flight planning and so on, uh, where speed, equals distance divided by time. So we need to be arranged, be arranged, able to rearrange that. Uh, but also we've got uh, the, the formulas in electrics, for example, where V equals I times R, voltage is current times resistance, or power equals I times, should make this more explicit the I's, uh, power is I times V, so power is current times voltage. Um, so all these formulas are of similar forms. A lot of the mass and balance uh, calculations are of a similar form as well. And even if we look at it, the, um, well actually, this is actually an important one to recognize. If we look at the lift formula. So unless you use pad pilot, um, lift equals CL times half rho V squared times S. And that doesn't look to be of this form because it's got more than three elements in it. Um, by the way, I, I said unless you use PyPilot, if you use PyPilot, obviously the CLs at the end, don't worry, doesn't make any difference. Um, but if we're going to manipulate the lift formula, then we're going to keep um, we're going to keep a lot of this constant. So let's say we're considering the comparison between the lift and the coefficient of lift at a constant speed then we can replace the whole lot of this by an arbitrary constant yeah, because it's not changing. Uh, and, and in fact, that's, that's how you will use uh, the lift equation. Um, 
So that would allow you just to, um, to change things around uh, as, again, as, as lift equals CL times some constant. Yeah. And so you can then, then see how the lift and the CL compare, how we change one, one of them and how the other is going to change. Okay. So that's, that's the example. So how do we rearrange it? Oh, the, the trigonometric functions as well. That's another classic example. Uh, let's, let's do one of those. Let's do that one of those. Because that's actually one you might, uh, certainly in principles of flight, when you look through principles of flight, the cosine. So the cosine of theta. So theta is just an angle we, we're considering. Cosine is the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. Now, what if I want to, I don't want to know the cosine of theta, let's say I know the cosine of theta, but I want to know the adjacent. How am I going to rearrange that? Well, what I want to do is to find, is to get the adjacent on its own on one side. Yeah, I want the adjacent to be sat there on its own. Everything else is the other side of the equation because I want an equation of the form adjacent equals something. Yeah, I don't remind what that something is because I can just stick it into a calculator. Doesn't matter what it is, but I want the, the, the equation to be of that form. And that's actually core to um, the, the algebra you need. That's, that's actually really the, um, what you should ha always have in mind is that you're trying to get whatever you want to know, you're trying to get it on its own by canceling out everything else. And so how am I going to cancel out the hypotenuse here? Well, I'm dividing by the hypotenuse. If I now multiply by the hypotenuse, well, there's two ways we can look at this. Um, the simplest way, which is the way you should probably hopefully end up thinking of this, uh, because it's going to be the quickest to, to, um, to analyze, is that multiplication and divisions are sort of opposites. If I divide by something and then I multiply by the same thing again, I'm going to get the same answer. If I halve something and then I multiply by two, I've got the same answer, haven't I? Yeah, I, I, I haven't changed anything. If I, if I go through a division by two and then a multiplication by two, the two things cancel each other out. Four divided by two is two. Multiply by two, we're back to four again. Yeah. Um, that's a very simple case, but it always applies. In fact, that's part of the definition of multiplication and division. Okay. Um, so it will always apply. Uh, the other way to look at it is the hypotenuse divided by the hypotenuse. We've now on this side got hypotenuse divided by hypotenuse. Uh, and that's one. Anything divided by itself. Other than zero, anything divided by itself is always one. Yeah? Sorry. That's a ma mathematician thing to say other than zero. Zero divided by zero is undefined. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You never have to do that. But anything divided by itself is one. So what we've got here is we've got the adjacent... Uh, multiplied by one. Okay, but I've had to multiply this by the hypotenuse, which means it's no longer equal to cos theta. But if I multiply cos theta by the hypotenuse, then the equal sign is still valid. Because, okay, so for that, sorry, I'm just gonna, because this is valid, okay, so cos theta is adjacent times hypotenuse, Cos theta times hypotenuse must be equal to adjacent divided by hypotenuse multiplied by hypotenuse. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's say this, we'll call this X. Well, this was also equal to X, wasn't it? And we've, it, we've now got hypotenuse times X equals X times hypotenuse. By the way, that's another part of the definition of multiplication is it's reversible. It doesn't matter which way, which order you do it. But, um, well, that's obviously the case. So we haven't changed anything. And that brings us to a rule that hopefully most of you know, but um, this is the sort of, this is again, a strict mathematical definition, um, is that if you, if you do the same thing to both sides of an equal sign, then you don't change anything. Yeah. Um, there, are, again, there are a couple of exceptions, things like divided, uh, Dividing or multiplying by zero, uh -huh. doesn't work. But, um, zero is odd, ignore it. As long as you're not getting, in, getting into zeros, um, then you do anything either side of an equal sign. Um, and 
the uh, the answer is uh, is still correct, or rather, the equal sign is still valid. Okay, so I'm going into a lot of depth on this, and probably a lot of you probably need probably know this, but we're also we we get we're approaching a um, a shortcut. Okay, so what we've said here is that. The hypotenuse multiplied by cosine of the angle is going to be the adjacent. Okay. Um, so, and, and that's what we want. We want the adjacent on its own um, equals something. Now, what have we done? If we, if I take this away, what I've got, what I've ended up with before was that the hypotenuse times cos theta equals the adjacent. That's what I ended up with, uh, if you remember. So there we go. Hypotenuse times cos theta equals adjacent. Um, what, what I've done effectively is I've removed the hypotenuse from this side. And I, how pe people tend to think of it is that they put it over to the other side. And that's a good way of thinking about it. But if it's on the bottom on one side, you've got to take it onto the top on the other side. So if you've divided it on the right hand side, I can move it to the left hand side. No problem. No problem with uh, moving it from the right hand side to the left hand side. Yeah. But if I've divided it on the right hand side, I need to multiply it on the left hand side. Yeah when I move it. So moving reverses divide and multiply. Um, usually we talk about the, it as a fraction, so the division as a fraction. So if it's on the bottom of the fraction of one side, we've got to take it to the top on the other side. Likewise, of course, I can reverse that process. Obviously, any, um, any process I do one way, I can reverse because the, the original uh, function was um, the, the original function is still valid, of course. Um, so I can put the hypotenuse back to the other side, but it's on the top on this side, so I have to put it underneath the adjacent on that side. And of course, we're back to where we started. Yeah, which that's always a useful thing to bear in mind in, in maths is that everything you do must be reversible. Uh, so uh, that does help sometimes. Um, okay, so most of you are probably familiar with that. Um, but what if I, instead of the adjacent, so we, so we now have a formula for the co cos theta, we have a formula for um, the hypotenuse. Yeah. Um, but what if I want, sorry, we've got a formula for the adjacent, my apologies. But what if we want a formula for the hypotenuse? Yeah. Um, that what the heck, sorry. Uh, that is, well, I hesitate to say it's slightly more involved, it's not particularly difficult, but um, we've got to go through effectively a two-step process for that. Yeah. Um, and in fact, in fact, I should probably go back to that. Uh, the first step is to get the hypotenuse onto the top. Because if I want a formula for hypotenuse, I don't want it on the bottom of a fraction. I want it on the top. So I, I take the hypotenuse onto the top. The second step, I want to get the hypotenuse on its own now. So the hypotenuse is on the top now, which is a, a first step. I want to get it on its own. So what I, what I want to do really is I want to divide by cos theta. Yeah. Um, that, does one of two, you can look at that in one of two ways. Either we've turned this into hypotenuse times one, because we've got cos theta divided by cos theta, which is one, um, unless cos theta is zero. Uh, yeah, that's one way of looking at it. Um, but the other way of looking at it is that um, I've multiplied by cos theta and divided, and the two things are opposites, so they cancel each other out. The two processes cancel each other out. But in order to keep the equal sign valid, I then need to divide this side by cos theta. Yeah. And 
that means, well, this cos theta divided by cos theta is just one, so we've ended up with the hypotenuse on its own on this side, is adjacent divided by cos theta. Yeah. Um, and there's a shortcut, and if you don't remember this, don't worry, you can go through that two-step process I've just gone through. But look what's just happened from this, for this formula, from the cos theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse. Effectively, I've swapped cos theta and hypotenuse. And this is, this is often a really good way of looking at this. Um, and in fact, it's sort of the basis of the triangle method, which, which we'll mention in a moment. Okay, so if I have a formula of the form, uh, let's just zip that away, uh, A equals B over C, yeah? So I've got A equals B over C. I can just swap the A and the C. So that means C equals B over A, yeah. Um, good one for radio nerve actually, because uh, we know that the formula C equals F lambda, which actually C is constant, so we never want to know C. So if you know F equals C over lambda, um, lambda is also equal to C over F. Yeah, so you're just swapping the F and the lambda around. So the frequency is the speed of light divided by the wavelength, and the wavelength is the speed of light divided by the frequency. Um, so that's that's a way of doing that particular one. Uh, but yeah, that's a shortcut. So if you see a f if you have a formula uh, that's of this form of a division, and you want to know the one that's on the bottom of the division, you swap that with the other side, and it makes it easy. The other one way you might often want to do that is um, radius of uh, the radius of turn. Not often, but there's a couple of questions where you radius of turn for uh, principles of flight. Uh, which is um, tan squared in meters per second, of course, divided by um, g times tan uh, g times tan phi, isn't it? The bank angle. Yeah, I can't remember it. Uh, yeah, it's a long time since I've taught principles, but actually. Uh, um, so if I want to know the bank angle. There's, a, there's a, a couple of questions where they effectively, you know the radius of turn, but you want to know the bank angle to achieve that radius of turn. What we can do is we can say that tan phi, tan of the bank angle, is tan squared divided by g times radius of turn. Yeah, so that's a useful one. Um, the g just remains in place. You've actually got four elements here, not three. Uh, but the D just remains in place. Yeah. So what you're doing here, of course, is the two, that two-step process of multiplying both sides by tan phi. Yeah. So these two end up cancelling out. Um, and then so we've got tan phi times, I'll just say R for radius of turn equals tan squared apologies oh, pressed the button I shouldn't have done tan squared over g and then on this one you're dividing both sides by r yeah and the r's cancel out on this side to give tan by equals tan squared over g times r so uh, even if there's another element in it the these processes still work fine now back to the pure three element, uh, I mentioned the triangle method. Um, if you're at cats, don't, don't let Stuart know you're doing this because he does, he has some objection to this. I can kind of see what he means, but um, he, he thinks you should be able to rearrange formulas and, and shouldn't need to use the triangle method. But um, I, I like Stuart, but yeah I, I, yeah, I don't object to it. Okay, so the triangle, that's a terrible triangle. It's bent. Okay, let's try and do a like, neater triangle with, with a bit more space in it as well. Okay, so the triangle method. Draw a triangle effectively like this, and I say that cos phi, it was theta, sorry, it's a theta, cos theta equals adjacent divided by hypotenuse. Yeah, and then what you can do is you can uh, cover up whichever you want to know. So if I want to know 
cos theta is obviously adjacent divided by hypotenuse. But if I want to know adjacent, cover up adjacent, then it's cos theta times hypotenuse, uh, which is what we just worked out. And if I want to know the hypotenuse, it's the adjacent divided by cos theta. Uh, and you only need to know one version of the formula to, to do this. So if you know that cos theta is adjacent divided by hypotenuse, you can make this triangle. If, on the other hand, what you know is uh, Ohm's law, which is V equals I times R, current times resistance, you can make, this is actually where I learned this triangle way, way back when I was at school doing, studying physics. You can do... V equals I times R. So if it's a multiplication, start out with the top one because you're then saying uh, the multiplication is on the bottom. Yeah. So you, so whatever you know, what what, what the, the formula you know is V. So put the V at the top. Yeah. And then the multiplication at the bottom. So V equals I times R. Now I can say that I is V divided by R, and R is V divided by I. Yeah. Any questions on using the triangle method? Has, ever, has, has anyone not seen the triangle method before? Okay, good. Uh, that's, that's, that's the simple way of using it uh, without even bothering to think. Um, okay. As for rearranging formulas, that's probably uh, that's probably enough. It's quite a lot of that. We've done half an hour and we're going to do rearranging formulas. But it is probably the most important bit of maths you have to do. Um, and I know a lot of people have forgotten it by the time they reach um, doing the ATPLs. So, okay. So the next, uh, any questions on rearranging formulas before I move on to standard index form? No, excellent. Standard index form. That's on your calculator at the bottom. If you've got FX eighty three GT, it's probably the bottom in the middle. There's a button that says times ten to the power x. Okay. Now one point four seven five. That's a random number, by the way times 10 to the power 5. If I multiply, you can do this on your calculator. <clears throat> if just multiply 1.475, multiply it by, uh, don't, don't, use, um, don't use the 10, 10 times 10 to the power x button, just multiply it by 10 and then press the, uh, there's a button that says x to the block like this, uh, it's in the top middle, or again on a, on a Casio. Um, that, that means that's just a power button. Uh, press that and five. You should have something like, let's, sorry, I will just, um, I can get my mouse working, I will just show you what you should have on you. Oh, you can't really, the, sorry, the light's not very good for the calculator, there we go. You should have something like that on your calculator. Yeah. Uh, and then if you press equals, the answer comes out to. Uh, equals. Uh, so it's one, four, seven, five, zero, zero. So notice the what we call the significant figures are the same. So the significant figures. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't have uh, So 147,500, so that's 147,500. Um, the significant figures are the ones that aren't leading zeros, everything from a leading zero. Um, sorry, everything from the first figure that's not a leading zero is considered a significant figure. Um, so when, they, when, when someone talks about three significant figures, that's, uh, that's a precision of sort of one in, in the thousands. Um, and it starts out with the significant figure starts out with the first figure that's not zero. Yeah. So our, we got, our significant figures are the same. But what's happened is it, sh it shifted. Okay, and how far has it shifted? Well, I had a decimal place here and it shifted uh, one, two, three, four, five numbers, five. 
Yeah, because 10 to the power of five is 100,000. If you, if, if you put this into your calculator, it'll tell you that. <clears throat> but if you, if you take 10 to the power anything, it's, it's a one and then that, no, so if we have 10 to the power X is going to be a one, then X zeros, X zeros, yeah, after it, 10 to the power X. So 10 to the power five is one to five zeros after it. And what it does, if we multiply by that, it shifts the whole value that many figures one way or another. Now, why is this so important? Well, it's so important because it's then easier to write very large or very small numbers um, we, uh, without making errors. And it's, this is most important in radio nav, by the way. Okay, so for example, a billion, okay, a billion is, so one billion is one, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's right, if I, I'm, I'm putting gaps in the middle. Uh, yeah, we use gaps because the people from the Anglophone countries tend to use commas and, uh, sorry, uh, and everyone else tends to use dots. It gets very confusing. Um, in the exams, by the way, unless it's over a million, they won't use any gaps at all. Yeah. Once it gets over a million, I believe they start to use a gap between the bunches of three. And notice this bunch is always bunches of three for the gaps. Okay, so a billion is that. But it can also be written as 10 to the power nine. Yeah, which means that, um, let's say, 4.6578 billion, which is 4,657,800,000 thousand can also be written as 4.6578 times 10 to the power 9. So, <clears throat> and that's a very easy form to write in. And the other thing is I've deliberately chosen billions because every third power is also given a name for physics. Yeah, So this is more going into the, the, the physics side, but this would be giga, wouldn't it? So if this had a unit, Let's say this was a unit of hertz. So this is this is a frequency, um, which is which is what I'm teaching this for, really. Uh, if I had this many hertz, that's the same as four point six five seven eight gigahertz. Yeah, um, and uh, but your calculator handles it with this times ten to the power uh, format. And you can type into your calculator. Now you can type into your calculator, put in 4.6578, then press times 10 to the X button. You don't then need, you don't need to multiply before that. Just press 10 times 10 to the X uh, and then a nine and press equals and it will come out with 4.6, et cetera, billion. Yeah. Okay. There's another trick your calculator does. This is, this is a, as much as anything, this is a calculator lesson. There's another trick your calculator does. If you now press the ENG button, the button that says ENG, it will turn it back into the form 4.6578 times 10 to the power 9. So you know without counting the, the how without counting how many numbers there are after the first number, then you know that this is in billions and this would be 4.6578 gigahertz, for example, if you if it was a frequency. Yeah. Is everyone happy with standard and next form on that direction? What about if I had 1.335 times 10 to the power minus five? Now that still shifts the decimal place, but it shifts it the other way. Now what it's going to do, if I change the color, is it's going to shift the decimal place to here. Okay, so that'd be naught. So I've got naught, that's one shift. Uh, but then it's going to shift it twice, three times, four times. Okay, so I've got that one, two, three, four, five times. So the, the, the decimal place is going to be here. This is ever so slightly confusing, by the way because we end up, instead of with five zeros, like we, on the positive, we end up, 
end up with five zeros in all, in all cases. We've ended up with four zeros. Um, so that times 10 to the minus five has given us four zeros ahead of it. Um, the reason is we've got to count the zero for units. So there are in fact five, a total of five zeros. Don't bother though, use your calculator. So obviously the calculator is going to resolve it all. I've got to take out that. Okay, so, so what I'd originally written was 1.35 times 10 to the power negative five. Um, so you, what you want to write on your calculator is 1.35 then press times 10 to the X, the button in the middle at the bottom, but then we want negative. Use the negative symbol on the left that's a bracketed minus, looks like a little TIE fighter. Let's call it the TIE fighter button. And, and, and the middle on the left, um, five. Okay, and if you right type that 1.35 times 10 to the power minus five. Oh, it, uh, uh, it's given it as times it. Um, beyond, I think, times 10 to the minus 3, it just writes it with the standard index form. If you now press ENG, this will then put it as one, uh, sorry, 13.5 times 10 to the power minus 6. Now, the reason for minus 6 is again, it's the third power. So when you're looking, uh, it's, it's the last third power you need down, by the way. If you are looking for a, right, again, this is radio now, a pulse length. This would be a pulse length in microseconds, for example. Yeah. So this will be a very small, uh, a, a very small time, the millionths of a second. So times 10 to the power minus six means millionths. So this is 13.5 millionths. Yeah. <clears throat> now, however, if I press shift ENG twice more, if you press shift ENG, and then shift ENG again, it will tell you that this equals 0.0000135 times 10 to the power zero. 10 to the power zero is one, by the way. Anything to the power zero other than zero is one. Yeah. Um, so when it says times 10 to the power zero, that's with no index at all. That is, that is the figure. We're multiplying it by one. So, okay. yeah. so that's what I'd written up here, wasn't it? So that is how standard index form works on the negative side. You'll very, I'm not gonna focus on it too much because you'll very rarely use it. You'll, literally, you'll only use this for probably pulse lengths on um, radio nav, yeah? What you want to know is what happens when you press ENG. That's actually the very far the most, because you'll do the calculation and you'll come up with a figure like, well, um, it will come up with a figure like 1.35 times, it will say this. To be honest, this is likely to be the answer to a question. It will say, say 1.35 times 10 to the minus five as the answer to the question. You'll then press ENG and the answer will then come out as 13.5 times 10 to the minus six. Um, and so you'll know that that's 13.5 microseconds as the answer. Yeah, that's the point. That's that's really why I'm teaching you this. Is that if you come up with a figure like this with a with an with a with an index on the end or a very very long number and you don't want to count the decimal places and risk miscounting, just press the ENG button and it gets you to the nearest third power of ten. And remember, we name the third powers of ten. Um, you should learn this in Radio Nav anyway, but they're they're, they're named upwards as um, Kilo, so so kilo is times ten to the power three. Uh, mega, you'll have heard of this in uh, in computers, if nothing else, is times ten to the power six, and giga is times ten to the oh, times ten to the power nine. Yeah, in computers you oh, you'll have heard of tera, which is times ten to the power twelve. We don't need to go that high. Um, then up going to the negative, we have milli which is times 10 to the power minus three, and micro, which is times 10 to the power minus six. Uh, as, um, as symbols, by the way, kilo is a, is a lowercase k, mega is a capital M, giga is a capital G, milli is a lowercase m, and micro is a mu, uh, which is a Greek M. Um, they'll probably, say, but in the exam, they'll say micro. The reason is that they can't get consistency across the authorities for fonts. So they never write Greek letters. We don't, we're not allowed to write Greek 
uh, Greek letters in our questions when we write them um, because they can't get consistency in the uh, so they will actually say microseconds they're not going they're not going to do what I did there which is mu s which is microseconds they're, they're going to do say microseconds uh, okay so that's the index form and if you get a number which you're not sure what which one of these it is just press the eng button um, the other thing with the eng button is if you uh, if you write in um, 2.56 times 10 to the power 9, it will come out with a big number, yeah? So we're writing 2.56 times 10 to the power 9. And then if I press ENG, it will say 2.56 times 10 to the power 9, yeah? So you would say the answer there is 2.56 gigahertz, for example, yeah? But what if all the answers are in megahertz? Well, if I press ENG again, and by the way, if you go the wrong way on this, shift ENG goes one way, ENG goes the other to shift these. But if I press ENG again, it says 2560 times 10 to the power of 6. So 2.56 gigahertz is the same as 2560 megahertz. So if all the answers are in megahertz, just press e ENG to get it in gigahertz, and then press ENG again, and it will get it in megahertz. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. I don't want to go any deeper into index form. Because really, it's all it is is about what you do with the calculator. Okay. Remember, you'll have the video of this, so you can always watch it again if, if you're confused by anything. Um, right. Trigonometry. So any, any questions on index form before we go on to trigonometry? Sorry? Oh, okay. Um, so trigonometry. As far as you've seen, trigonometry is about... Um, it's about angles on a triangle. And kind of it is, but the main thing is, um, mathematicians call the trigonometric formulas the circular formulas, or um, yeah, the circular functions, sorry. Okay, so sine and cosine are the circular functions. The reason is that they are the coordinates of a unit circle. So if, if I draw a circle, one unit, uh, about the origin of a graph, the coordinates of the points on there are the sine and cosine of an angle. OK, uh, we'll look at that in a minute because we need to extend beyond 90 degrees. And that's the only way we can extend beyond 90 degrees. But let's quickly look at how they are used with a triangle. OK. So if I have an angle here that I'm going to call theta. Okay, the angle theta is, um, has, uh, uh, sorry, an angle here that I call theta on a right angle triangle. So this always applies to a right angle triangle. Then the triangle has three sides that I can name. Now, the longest side I'm always going to call the hypotenuse. Uh, that's not anything complicated. All that is is the name for the longest side of a right angle triangle in Greek. Yeah, so that's all it is. No, it's just a word you need to know. No other meaning than that. This side is opposite that angle. Yeah, in this, within this triangle, the side that's opposite that angle, the i.e. it's not next to that angle or adjacent to it, is here. So I'm going to call this the opposite. But this side is adjacent to the angle, so I'm going to call it the, the adjacent. Yeah. Now, regardless of how big or small I draw this triangle, I can, um, I can cut off this triangle to be much smaller with the same angles or medium size, or I can go, I can take it up to be bigger. But the ratio side, the comparison of two of those sides is always going to be the same. Yeah, if the, for example, if the adjacent is twice as long as the opposite, which is possible, then with the, regardless of the size of the triangle, if the angles are the same, then the adjacent is always going to be twice as long as the opposite. Yeah. If the hypotenuse is twice as long as the opposite, then the angle is always going to be 30 degrees. So if the angle is 30 degrees, then the hypotenuse is always going to be twice as long as the opposite. Yeah, always. I know that because it's, 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 it's one of the simple ones to know. Sine of 30 is a half. And that's, what, that's where that comes from. But that's, that's always going to be the case. So we can write three fractions, three ratios, where, oh, sorry. Sine of theta is the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. Yeah. C 
cosine of theta equals the adjacent divided by the high faulty news. And tan of theta equals the opposite over the adjacent. Yeah. And that's just how sine, cosine, and tangent are defined. Um, if you go into more complicated maths, there is a meaning to the words, but you don't need to know that. Yeah, you don't need to know what that meaning is. There's some great YouTube videos on it if you're really interested um, that show that they, they've got nice animated sketches, which I can't, I don't have the capacity to make. Uh, <coughs> so uh, if, you, if you're really interested in Greek and maths, then look at that. But otherwise, just accept that these are defined as the ratio between two of these sides. Yeah. Um, now, what does that mean for practical purposes? Um, well, really, it means, really, not necessarily a huge amount, except that if you ever see a right angle triangle on any diagram you draw, then you're likely to get a trigonometric function. Um, so a classic case for us in Principles of Flight would be in the climb, would be working out uh, lift in the climb, for example. So if I draw a badly drawn aeroplane, sorry for helicopter guys, it's not really relevant to you, but uh, okay. So I've got an aeroplane that's flying up like this and lift is by definition at 90 degrees to the flight path. Okay, um, but weight on the other hand is by definition at uh, in the vertical. Now, I should have done vectors first probably for this actually because we're, we're going to do a little vector trick here. Um, <clears throat> so I've got lift here and weight here. Um, now the lift is overcoming part of the weight. Now it can't completely overcome the weight because it's not in the opposite direction. But, but the lift is overcoming a certain part of the weight. So I can, sorry, I can draw a straight line here, which is opposite direction to the lift, which is a component of the weight. So the, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm ignoring the vectors here. I'm just gonna say that the length of that is the same as the lift length of the lift vector. <coughs> but I can then complete a right angle triangle here. So there is another vector here, which is part of the weight, which we're going to treat separately. But the important thing is I want to know how the lift and the weight compare. Well, it turns out that I've got the weight vector here, which is at right angles to the vertical. Yeah, so weight is always, sorry, right angles to the horizontal. It's always vertical. Weight is always vertical, which is right angles to the horizontal. And I've got lift here, which is at right angles to the flight path. So the angle between the two must be the same as the angle between the horizontal and the flight path. So this angle here must be gamma because gamma is the angle between the horizontal and the flight path and the weight is at right angle to the horizontal, lift is at right angles to the flight path. So the angle between the two must be the same as the angle between the horizontal and the flight path. That's gamma. So I can now show this as a triangle Let's do it in a completely different color. Just okay. So I can show this as a triangle with weight on this side, lift on this side, and gamma here. Well, we can see that that it being a right angle triangle is subject to trigonometry. And I've got I know the adjacent. This is the adjacent, and I know the hypotenuse. This is how we work out which trigonometric function is going to be relevant. Look what we well, look what we know. So we know the hypotenuse and the adjacent. Well, the hypotenuse and the adjacent come into the cosine formula. So I can say that cos gamma, which is our uh, prime angle, is going to be adjacent, which is lift, divided by weight. Now, if I rearrange that, <coughs> I can say that lift equals, well, I'm going to, I want, so that, sorry, this, this, is, this is lift and this is weight. The whole word. 
I'm going to take weight to the other side. <clears throat> and so remember the way we did it, that's going to end up being weight times cos gamma. And that's where our lift equals weight times, no, my, my gammas are not very good, there you go, times cos gamma uh, for the climb and descent comes from. Yeah, and that's, that's how we use trigonometry. And to be honest, it shouldn't get any more complicated than that. For your for your learning purposes in the exams it shouldn't even be that complicated because hopefully you remember that formula in the in the learning process right actually okay, sorry um the final thing i've got to say and this comes into one formula and i don't, I don't really like the formula but it's one formula in instruments it's the rate of transport drift requires this but i will briefly say it just so something makes sense that otherwise doesn't make sense if I divide sine theta by cosine theta, I get opposite over hypotenuse on the top, oh, hypotenuse on the top, and I get adjacent divided by hypotenuse on the bottom. But we divide the top by hypotenuse and the bottom by hypotenuse. <coughs> A bit of um, algebra I didn't mention, which is, is very rarely important, but it is occasionally, um, as well as if, if I do if I do the same thing to either side of an equal sign, it remains constant. Yeah, that's what we that's what we're relying on in the algebra. If I multiply top and bottom of a fraction by the same thing, <coughs> the answer comes out as the same. Yeah, I can't do it with additional subtraction. It's only multiplication or multiplication or division. But so if I multiply the top by the hypotenuse and I multiply the bottom by hypotenuse, the answer is not going to change. That that fraction doesn't change. But what happens is those hypotenuse cancel out. Yeah. So what I get is opposite over adjacent. Uh, so sine over cosine is opposite over adjacent, which is tan of theta. It comes into that stupid formula. Um, <clears throat> that's why you end up with a tan latitude in the rate of transport drift formula. It has come up in one or two questions. I don't know if it's still coming up in questions, but it has. Um, it's something all mathematicians recognise very important, but eh, we don't really care about it. Uh, but that's where it comes from. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the basic trigonometry. But how then do I come up with? Oh, why is this not on? How then do I come up with a sine wave? Okay, so if I look at something like um, something like a, a wave function, waveform of a, uh, a radio wave, <clears throat> we call it a sine wave because it goes up like that and down like that, and this is a graph of sine, but it's constant and repeti re uh, repetitive. It does repeat. <clears throat> okay, what, why? What does that all mean? Because um, if I actually label the axes of this, uh, this point is 90 degrees. This point is 180 degrees. Well, how do I have sine of 180 degrees if it relates to a, a, a triangle? You can't, have a, you can't have a right angle triangle with the other angles 90 degrees. It has to be, the other angles have to be less than 90 degrees, don't they? Uh, so we've got 270 there and 360 there. <clears throat> well, the other way of expressing sine and cosine and talking about sine and cosine, I've already mentioned it, is that they're the circular formulas. So if I draw a graph of a circle, and it, um, it, it's easiest to describe a unit circle, although it, it relates to any, any circle really, but if I take a, a unit circle, so what I mean by unit circle is I've got the x-axis, the x-axis here, the y-axis here, this is a perfect circle and this point here is one uh, so x equals one y equals zero so it would i suppose it should be the coordinates of that point would be one zero and that means it's a circle with a radius of one yeah um well, what's the generalization of the the um coordinates of different points around that circle so if i take a unit line there uh, what are the coordinates of this point? Well, if this angle here is theta, 
the coordinates of this point, well, I can actually write, draw a right angle triangle here, can't I? I can drop a line there, and the horizontal line of that right angle triangle is the x coordinate, and the vertical line is the y coordinate. But the horizontal line is also the adjacent. So the x coordinate, okay, so oh, cos theta equals uh, adjacent over hypotenuse. So I want to know what the adjacent is. So adjacent equals hypotenuse times cos theta. But the hypotenuse is the radius of the circle, so it's one. So in this case, it equals cos theta. Okay. And if I say sine theta equals opposite over hypotenuse, uh, I can then say the opposite equals hypotenuse times sine theta. Well, we already said the hypotenuse is one, was that just sine theta? So this line here is the y coordinate, this is the x coordinate. And so it turns out that the coordinates of that point are cos theta sine theta. Okay. And what we do is we then say that the coordinates of this point are then cos theta sine theta for a theta that goes around from the x-axis. So this, this is theta. So what that means is we can carry on tracking this point around the circle and say that each set of coordinates of it are cos theta sine theta. And that's where this pattern comes from. Yes. Um, of the sine wave and the cosine wave. Now, you don't need to know, let's see, maybe a little more detail than you need to know, but you certainly don't need to know any more detail than that. Um, it's, it's actually some, um, this is, by the way, this, a lot of this is why sine and cosine are so important in math and they are vitally important in math. They're, they're, they're incredibly useful in math. Um, so that's the sine wave. The cosine wave has a similar pattern, it turns out, but it's just offset by 90 degrees. Yeah, so the cosine, so a cosine wave goes like this. But that's how we can take a sine wave and go to more than 90 degrees. And that's why it keeps cycling. Yeah, because if I go back to here, if I carry on tracking my point round around the circle, each time we pass zero, theta is zero, then uh, actually then theta is 360 next time, isn't it? And, but we're passing the same point as theta equals zero. So the theta equals 360 is the same as three, theta equals zero. And theta equals 370 is the same as theta equals 10, etc. Yeah, so it keeps cycling. We go round and round as many times as you like. And that's where the sine wave, the idea of a sine wave comes from. Yeah. You don't need, there's no point in you knowing any more detail than that, as far as I can see. If you, if you want to know, ask me and I'll do another video on it in more depth. But, okay, any questions on trigonometry before we go any further? The thing with trigonometry in terms of the triangle, which is mainly how we use it, don't overcomplicate things. It's, um, it is literally just the ratio of sides of a triangle, the trigonometry in that case, the, the, from zero to 90 degrees. Okay, vectors. What is a vector? Um, well, we have to discuss scalars first. So, so a scalar and a vector quantity are the two different types of types of number really. So a scalar is just a number. Yeah. Um, and it has, um, it might have units, but other than that, it's, it, what it's not got is a direction. So it's just a number stroke, we'll call it magnitude. It's the size of the number that's, that's the only important thing. A vector is a magnitude or size and direction. Yeah, so it always going to need, uh, so it's now two numbers. 
Yeah. It's no longer just a number. We can't represent a vector by a single number um, or more, two, two numbers or more. Um, a three dimensional vector needs three numbers, a four dimensional vector needs four numbers. Most of the vectors we look at will be two dimensional. So it, um, it only needs two, uh, two numbers. So for example, the, um, your ground movement vector, your, your movement across the ground can be represented by your track or course, which is one number, isn't it? So that's the angle from true north or magnetic north, whichever you've chosen, um, is the angle from that, uh, and your ground speed. The two of those will represent your, um, the vector for your path across the ground. So it only requires two numbers. Now, if you wanted to do L nav or V nav, you've then got, you then also got, you then starting to do a, vert a vertical component as well. We don't, we've, I'm trying to think, I don't think we do that, we're going to use that at all in the theory side. Yeah, your uh, FNS does it, obviously, because it's got to do LNAV and VNAV. So once you're flying an aircraft with an FMS, it does it. Um, but you don't need to care about it at the moment uh, for, for, for the purposes of, of the course. Um, now, really, there's only two things math. Um, Mathematically, you need to know about manipulating vectors, and both of them rely on how we draw the vector, how we represent the vector. Now, the easiest way to represent a vector is with a line. Yeah, because, uh, sorry, it, actually, I shouldn't say a line, I should say an arrow because it's got to have a direction. That vector is not the same, not, sorry, is not the same as that vector. So that vector and that vector are two different vectors. Yeah, they're 180 degrees apart. So technically, it shouldn't just be a line, it should be an arrow. And in fact, we have a convention, don't we, for, for example, for navigation, that one arrow head means it's the air vector, two arrow head means it's the ground vector, and three arrow head means it's the wind vector. They are all, they are all vectors. And the, um, the number of arrow heads in that case is just coding which, what, what the vector means. The, the direction of the arrow is the important thing for the vector. Okay, this is known as a velocity vector, by the way. That's um, so in the, on the physics side of it. Speed is a scalar quantity, whereas velocity is a vector quantity. Velocity ha has a speed, which is magnitude and a direction. Okay, so if I draw that on a piece of paper and there is some symbol to show my standard, so that would be maybe that's north. Uh, that could be north, that could be straight up, that could be the heading of the aircraft, depending on exactly what the ve I'm meaning the vector to mean. Um, so let's say that's north. Um, then the angle between my reference and the line is representing the direction of the vector. And the length of the vector to some defined scale represents the, um, the magnitude of the vector. In fact, in Gen Nav, we are supposed to teach you to draw these vectors out as a vector triangle to work out, for example, your track and ground speed from the heading TAS vector and the wind vector, wind uh, speed, speed and direction vector. And you're supposed to be able to draw those out uh, on a piece of paper. We don't because it's just as easy to do on a flight computer. Uh, so you don't, but it's technically in the syllabus to do that. And in fact, if any of you have learned sailing navigation, sailors actually do this. They actually draw them out. They draw out what they call a, usually a 15 minute triangle or a 30 minute triangle in a slow boat. Um, and they draw how far you will sail across the water at say six knots in 30 minutes. So it's going to be three nautical miles um, in certain direction. And then they'll draw out the tidal vector from the tide tables from the tide graph, tide um, charts, uh, and that will then tell them the, the, how far they're going to move and in what direction with respect to the ground. They actually do that, which is equivalent to you drawing out your heading TAS vector for, say, five minutes. Obviously, your, your vector triangle will be huge if you did an, uh, a 30-minute triangle, um, but say a, a, say a 10-minute triangle. So you do 10 minutes of how far you fly, 10 minutes of how far the wind is going to um, blow you and in which direction, and that will give you the ground vector. 
we're not expecting you to do that because it, as I say, technically we're supposed to teach you that, but you can do it on the CRP5 and it's pointless. It's utterly useless exercise for aviation because uh, you have a CRP5. Um, but that's how we represent a vector, okay, is with an arrow. And the length of the arrow is the, it, at some scale. Of course, if the vector isn't anything to do with distance, so if it's to do with speed, we can do a, the distance you'll travel in 15 minutes. But if the vector's a force, yeah, so let's say, so force is a vector. Yeah, let's, let's talk about weight vector. So the weight vector will always go vertically down towards the center of the Earth, but the length of it can represent the mass. Now, if you were to do this to scale, you would have to define the scale. You say one millimeter equals um, 10 kilograms or something like that. No, so sorry, kilograms, it should be newtons, my apologies, 100 newtons. I'm being a spanner there. Kilo kilograms is mass, which is a scalar. Yeah, newtons is force, which is a vector. Okay, so one millimeter is 100 newtons. Yeah, and then that would be the scale for your, um, for your thing. And then you, could, then you could measure the length of this and decide how big the vectors were. Okay, why is that important? Well, that's important if we ever need to add up vectors, which is what we tend to do, which is what the flight computer is doing. If I want to add my wind vector to my air vector, so there's how, there is my heading and TAS. So the direction of that line represents my heading, and the length of that line represents my TAS. So that's the vector of my flight through the air. If I then want to apply the wind to that, uh, all I need to do is connect the two vectors so I'm now going to draw the wind vector. By convention, we use three arrowheads, as I said on that. Um, and I, I, I have to connect it. To add up two vectors, I connect them head to tail. And I'm effectively doing a map. I'm doing a map now in X amount of time. How far would I fly and in what direction? And then how far would the wind blow me and in which direction? And on a map going in this direction for this distance and this direction for this distance would have exactly the same effect as going in this direction for this distance. And so that is what we call the resultant vector. If we add two vectors, the one we add up to is known as the resultant vector. You might come across this term. Um, and in, in the case of, oh, sorry, uh, what I didn't do was say this is wind, um, direction and speed so wind velocity when we talk about wind velocity it has a direction and speed doesn't it you actually even in the vernacular of aviation we actually use that term don't we we talk about wind velocity and you're expecting to get the wind direction and the speed um and so we're acknowledging that that velocity has direction and and speed or has direction and magnitude and here we end up with the vector of our track or course and ground speed and that's how, that's how we add up vectors. Now, of course, we can also subtract vectors. So if I know my track and ground speed and I know my wind, I can find my heading and tats. But to subtract them, we put them head to head. Yeah. So we put, uh, we put the two vectors head to head and then it goes from, um, yeah, the tail of the short one to the tail, sorry, tail of the long one to the tail of the short one. So what, we, what we're doing then is a map of going up the long one and then down this one. Yeah. Um, that's not something we will really do though. You'll mainly be adding. So that's the first thing we need to know about vectors is that you can add them up and they go head to tail. The second thing, the only other thing you need to know about manipulating vectors mathematically is that they can always be broken up into two components at 90 degrees to one another. And this is mainly relevant to um, principles of flight. Um, yeah, so if I take a vector, okay, and maybe it's a force vector, uh, or I think it could be anything, the um, one we've just done is a force vector. Uh, if I take a, a vector, um, let's say that's my lift vector, and in, in a bank, my lift vector is turned, isn't it? Yeah, so let's do a, an aeroplane at the end of this. Oh, actually, no, I'm doing a helicopter for you, Dan. Um, actually, it's not for you, it's because it's easier to draw. 
Okay, so there's my total rotor thrust or the lift if you're uh, an aeroplane pilot. Yeah, so then, okay, so TRT or lift. Okay, now I can split that into two components at 90 degrees because that direction is not a helpful direction. Okay, let's say I'm at 30 degree angle of bank. Well, that's 30 degrees off the vertical, 60 degrees off the horizontal. Yeah, what kind of use is that? I want to consider two things. I want to consider for a start how much of that total reaction, total rotor thrust or lift is giving, is opposing the weight. Okay, I need the vertical component because this is equal in magnitude to the weight. Okay, it's opposite direction. So it's not that. When, remember I said, I'm going to ignore the direction of the vectors before. Um, yeah, this, this, this is a horrible thing to do mathematically, by the way. I should say magnitude of the weight. We're not that bothered. We're not, we're not being pedantic here. The length of this is equal to the length of the weight vector. It's just the opposite in direction. Remember I said two vectors that are parallel and opposite are still different vectors. Um, so this is parallel to and opposite to the weight vector. And that's the vertical component. But the length of that has to be equal to the weight vector. Otherwise, the aircraft is going to start a descent or start a climb, isn't it? Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just going to move my label here. Because um, it was this that was my total, total rotor thrust or lift. Um, and so I then have a horizontal component. So I've... Remember what I was saying at the beginning was I can split that vector, the total rotor thrust and lift into two vectors that are at 90 degrees. And if those directions are more useful now, usually by more useful, I mean vertical and horizontal. That's that, not always the case, but nearly always the case. Sometimes it will be in line with the flight path or something like that. But usually that's going to be horizontal and vertical. Yeah. Uh, so, um, for the aeroplane side of it, you also, when you get total reaction, you split total reaction into lift and drag, and they're at 90 degrees to each other, aren't they? Just in more useful direction. Yeah. So we can always take components of a vector, and those components are at 90 degrees to each other. And notice what we're doing with those components is adding them up. So the, the, the yellow component here, add the green component, gives me the blue component. Yeah, so we're, we're back to, if you follow that map of the vector from, the, uh, from its origin, you follow one vector, then follow the other, then the resultant vector is, is my total rotor thrust or lift vector, the blue vector, isn't it? Yeah. So um, these two processes are closely connected. Well, well, this is just a special case of adding up two vectors to make a third. Yeah. And this is this is what and you will do this quite a lot with vectors in the in the overall in the exams is that um, it will split one vector into two components. Um, and it's all it, it's a valid thing to do. If I put an, a vertical force like that and a horizontal force like that, it's entirely equivalent to putting a single um, angled force like this. Um, and of course, what this one is, by the way, is our centripetal force. What that means is it's the force pulling us around the turn. Yeah, the force in the turn, for example. Uh, we'll talk about that more probably actually this afternoon in physics. Uh, any questions on this? Any, any questions on vectors? Because that's really all you need to know about vectors. I don't want to go... Again, there's a load more of interesting stuff about vectors, but... It does confuse you and it's not needed for the exam. If you're really interested in vectors, loads of stuff. There's, there's some good math videos on YouTube if you want to go into depth. They just go into more depth than you really need. So. Uh, ratios and graphs. Okay, so uh, <coughs> ratios. A ratio is the same as a fraction. So it's a comparison between two numbers. Uh, it's, by the way, it should have no units. Um, we'll talk about units and uh, those doing physics, or if you want to watch the physics video, that's probably the first thing we're going to talk about in physics uh, this afternoon is 
uh, units and um, uh, dimensions. Uh, so this should be what we call dimensionless, which means it has no units because the units cancel out when we divide. Okay, so it's com when we compare the two. Um, so for so for something like scale, scale is a ratio, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking about um, let's say we've got a one to five hundred thousand scale. That means one millimeter on the map represents five hundred thousand millimeters on the Earth, but also one inch on the map represents five hundred thousand inches on the Earth. So the unit doesn't matter that's the point uh, okay um, and a, a ratio of uh, x to y is the same as the fraction x over y so in a ratio the first number is the numerator remember the numerator is the top number on a on a fraction and the second number is a denominator Yeah. Um, and really, the, they, they can be manipulated just like fractions. So what it means is if I multiply either um, both sides by the same thing, then the ratio stays the same. That's an important thing for calculating scale. So if, I, if halfway through my scale calculation, I have a, a ratio of four to um, two million, uh, I can divide the left by four because I always want a ratio of one to something, don't I? And as long as I divide the right by four, uh, and I end up with one to five hundred thousand. Yeah. Um, so these two ratios are exactly equivalent, um, and it's just where we obviously we always use the one uh, on scale. We always use one on the one as the numerator of scale, um, so the denominator that changes. Um, okay. Uh, so that's how ratios work. We've already sort of touched on ratios of triangles and lines. Um, and so all those trigonometric functions we were using before are ratios. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a way of comparing two numbers where the scale doesn't matter. The actual, the, the magnitude, the total magnitude doesn't matter. Yeah. So on the, on the, as we said about the trigonometry triangles, the, the right angle triangles, if we have a tiny, tiny triangle and then a huge triangle but with the same angles, the ratio of the sides is still going to be the same. Yeah, and so our trigonometric formulas end up the same. Okay, and that's really just the meaning of ratios. Now, the only reason I want to, wanted to mention that was to get everything clear before we looked at some, um, it, it's a minor point, but uh, a little bit about graphs. And the only thing I really want to go on about graphs, because most, I think most people are fine with the basics of how graphs work. But one thing that does sometimes cause confusion is um, tangents to curves and what a tangent to a curve means. Um, and what we need there, what we need for that, what we, sorry, we need to consider for that is a gradient. And a gradient turns out to be a ratio, so um, that's why I that's why I covered ratios first. To be honest, in and of themselves, ratios are used in a very simple way in the exam. Okay, let's take a fairly familiar curve. In fact, I'm going to do I'm going to do the other fairly familiar curve for the aeroplane guys. Um, okay, so this is a power required curve. Yeah. So this is a power required curve for an aeroplane. Now there are similar things for helicopters, of course, um, but they do, they do weird things at the low speeds. Okay, and so what we have here is uh, we usually get TAS for power required. Remember, uh, that's a bit of physics. That's because power equals um, force, we'll call it. The power required would be um, drag multiplied by TAS. That's why we do it against TAS, whereas we tend to do the drag curve against um, EAS or CAS. Okay, so what I've got on the left here is power, uh, and I've got TAS on there, and then this is the curve, the change in, in power required um, for uh, different TASs. Okay, now what if I draw the tangent to the power required curve? Now that means a couple of interesting things. That's actually, that's why I've done this is because it's actually really interesting the tangent to the power curve. 
uh, more mathematical than anything. But okay. So the tangent to the power curve would be the point where that would be the point where a straight line from the origin, from the zero, when we say the origin, that's the zero, zero point of the curve. So that's zero power, zero tau's point. Okay, a straight line from that just touches the curve in one place. So a tangent is a line that just touches a curve in one place. It's a straight line that touches a curve in one place. So when we say the tangent, we always mean the tangent from the origin. Yeah, and uh, we, we, uh, one of these, we can actually change it slightly depending on the wind and so on. But for now, and if you just say the tangent, it's always the tangent from the origin. So unless otherwise specified, it's always the tangent from the origin. Okay, so that just touches the curve at about this point. My curve isn't very good, so I, uh, okay, so that just touches the curve at this point. Okay, um, and so at this point, um, that's that's what we, we we would call the tangent to the origin, the, the point of tangency, or the, the tangent to the origin. Okay, now what about this line? I've now got a straight line. And a straight line has a gradient. And the gradient of any line is always the vertical change over the horizontal change, y over x. So y is going to be the vertical change, and so we'll call this y, and we'll call, we'll call this x. Yeah. Uh, and that's, y, that's the y and x for this point. It's actually also the y and x for this point, but that point's nothing because it's not on the curve. It's really a, we really only care that it's the y and the x for this point because y is going to be the power required and x is going to be the TAS for that point on the curve. Now, anything else is impossible, so it doesn't matter that it is. Yeah? Um, anything, by the way, anything below this curve um, is impossible. We can't fly. Yeah? Anything above this curve, we're climbing. Yeah, and the on, any straight and level flight is somewhere on this curve. That's what this curve means. Yeah, anything below this is, is descending. I, I, I shouldn't say impossible, it's, it's descending. Anything below this is descending. Anything above it is climbing. Yeah, so this curve represents all possible cases of straight and level flight. Okay, so what's the important of this, importance of this? Well, it's the, lowest ratio of power required lowest ratio of power required to TAS on a piston engine airplane what is the fuel burn proportional to can anyone tell me what the fuel burn is proportional to on a pit, on a, sorry, on a on a on a propeller driven aircraft, I should say, because it applies to turboprops as well. So on a propeller driven aircraft, how do you how do you estimate the or or what how does the fuel flow change? What what does it relate to? It's 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 closely proportional to the power. Yeah. So of course, power required straight and level is the same as the power we're using if we're flying straight and level. So if the fuel burn is proportional to the power required, this is also the lowest ratio of fuel flow to TAS on a, a propeller driven aircraft with a prop. Yeah, so that's our best range speed for a prop. Yeah. That's quite nice, isn't it? Um, so, so, and it's all to do with, with the meaning of a tangent and the gradient of the tangent. The reason is, it's the, um, it's the lowest gradient that actually touches the curve. I can always do a higher gradient than that, yeah? I can draw a gradient like this, and I can either fly at this speed or I can fly at this speed, yeah, if I've got enough power, um, but, that's got a higher gradient, and the gradient is the ratio of power required to TAS. Yeah, because the gradient is the ratio of y to x. Obviously, this is this is the same as the ratio of y to x. Yeah. Um, so 
so the tangent to the curve is the lowest possible straight and level um, gradient of this tangent, which is the lowest possible straight and level power required to TAS ratio. So if, if I try a lower gradient to my curve, it doesn't work because it, so it doesn't hit the curve at all. So I can't have a lower, lower gradient of a tangent, of a, of a straight line from the origin. Yeah, because of course, the, if I want to consider this, this point here, yeah, the, um, if, I want, if, I, if I consider the gradient of the line through that point, the gradient will also equal power required over TAS, but that's going to be a higher gradient. So, so for every unit TAS, we're going to have a higher power required. So the, the tangent to the curve is the lowest possible gradient. Therefore, it's the lowest possible power required to TAS ratio, which is the lowest fuel flow to TAS ratio. And that's why the tangent to the curve gives you the best range. Now, jet burn fuel proportional to thrust. Now, thrust straight and level equals drag. So that's why you use the, the tangent to the drag curve for the best range speed for a jet. Yeah. There is another, um, has anyone got any questions about this? Why the lowest, why the tangent is the, is the best ratio of um, power, of, of power required to TAS? Because if I draw a lower, okay, so the gradient, what I should have said is the gradient of this line from the origin is power required divided by TAS, so the ratio of power required to TAS, yeah? And this is the lowest possible gradient that touches the curve. That's the point, it's the lowest gradient that touches the curve. Any lower gradient doesn't touch the curve, yeah? Uh, and we have to be on the curve to fly straight and level, as we said before. Um, so it's the lowest possible power required to TAS ratio that we can fly straight and level, therefore it's the lowest fuel flow to TAS ratio we can fly straight and level. Yeah. There is another interesting consequence to it. So, um, so it's the lowest power required divided by TAS. But, Again, if you want to know why, watch the physics this afternoon. Power required equals drag multiplied by TAS. Yeah? So that equals drag. Weirdly enough, the gradient of this curve equals drag. Yeah? <laughs> Sorry, not this curve. The, the gradient of this line drawn on the power required curve, the gradient of that line is drag, yeah? Now that means a couple of things. For a start, it means that this TAS here represents minimum drag speed. That's the TAS equivalent of VMD. VMD of course is a, is a CAS, not a TAS, uh, or an IAS, it's CAS, yeah. yeah. Don't, don't worry about whether it's CAS or IAS. It's, it's a CAS, not a TAS, but this is the TAS equivalent of VMD, uh, of the gradient. It's because we're dividing the lowest power required over TAS ratio. Uh, sorry, we, sorry, because it's, the no, because it's the lowest power required over TAS ratio. Power required to TAS ratio. And power required is drag times TAS. So if we're, if we're dividing drag times TAS by TAS, we get drag. Right, the other consequence of this is as you climb, and this is, that's one of the points you need to know. You must know that the tangent to the power curve, for example, is the um, minimum drag point. The other consequence of this, because minimum drag doesn't change with altitude, 
when we change the altitude, our power curve is just going to follow this tangent. And it's really weird. That, um, so what we've got is we've got low altitude here and then we've got high altitude here. Um, the graph must, must shift up and right. And it must shift along this gradient. They have the same, along, sorry, along the tangent. They have the same tangent because minimum drag is always the same. Drag doesn't change with altitude. Yeah, I, ignoring, we're ignoring wave drag here. We're ignoring Mach effect. Uh, so, so ignoring, so assuming we don't go beyond Mach crit, drag doesn't, drag for, ta, for CAS, sorry, doesn't change with altitude. So our minimum drag doesn't change with altitude. Um, the actual drag, the, the TAS for minimum drag will change, the CAS doesn't, but the TAS for minimum drag will change, uh, um, will change, but the actual drag itself doesn't, so it must shift up this curve, which helps you really remember how this happened. But anyway, that's how tangents work. Tangents tell you the lowest or potentially the highest gradient. There's another one. Okay, so this is telling you the lowest possible gradient you can fly at. And the gradient is telling you either the power required to TAS ratio, which is the drag, or it's telling you the fuel flow per TAS, how the, the ratio of fuel flow to TAS. Uh, there is another graph you uh, aeroplane guys need. Um, there's probably some helicopter ones I can't, I can't think of at the moment, Dan, but there's probably some heli relevant helicopter stuff as well. Uh, but there's another graph the aeroplane guys need which is your polar, which also has a tangent, but the tangent, sorry, that's a horrible polar. Um, so your CLCD polar goes like this, doesn't it? Um, so here is CD, oh, I should have done that first. This is CD and this is CL. Okay, and this is the tangent to the curve, yeah? Um, and that's the highest possible. So the gradient is going to be CL over CD or the ratio of CL to CD, whichever you want to, um, however you want to put it, but it's coefficient to lift over coefficient to drag. But this is the highest CL CD ratio. Um, if I, I if I draw a line that's got a higher gradient than that, it's going to miss the curve. And so anyway, that's the point. Every point on that curve, if I put a line from the origin through any point on that curve, then the gradient of that of that line is the CLCD ratio. Yeah, but that's the highest possible CLCD ratio, the, the tangent. Yeah. So the tangents are always going to be the highest gradient or the lowest gradient. This is the only one where it's the highest, I think. Everything else is going to be the lowest gradient. But the gradient is a ratio of the two figures. So it's the lowest possible ratio of those two figures or the highest if you reverse it. Yeah, that's why tangents are important. Because it's either the highest or the lowest possible ratio. Okay. Are there any questions about tangents and about ratios and gradients and so on? because otherwise I think I've finished the maths. Does any, uh, is there any, uh, any maths anyone else thinks they should, feels they feel they should know? Anything else that's confused you mathematically in the exams? Excellent. <laughs>